in. Greetings. Happy Tuesday. Welcome to the Steve Day Show here on Blaze TV, radio and podcast, live and on demand. I am Steve Day. It's not even the first winter storm of the season will deter us from being here for you today because all three of us were able to utilize four-wheel drive to get in here this morning. God bless that uh, innovation, right? It's almost like you just don't even notice anything. Now you can't go, you can't go crazy because you don't have four wheels stop, right? You know, so you can't go like 70. Okay. But if you're going a nice, reasonable speed, just plow right through all this. Yeah. I just put new tires on my vehicle in August and yeah, it took me about the same time, maybe five extra minutes. Yeah. Same here. Yeah. It helped the roads. I don't know for me, they were pretty empty when I rolled in. I well, rolled in a little help. earlier than you. Yeah, that does help. A lot of people still aren't out, but uh, we are here to bring you the the same standard of mediocrity that you are accustomed to. Because <clears throat> who else, other than lots of other people, could they hire to fill this difficult job of the time slot after one of the most popular broadcasters in American media history? You know what I'm saying? I do. I mean, it's, there's just not a lot of people that would be uh, that would wish to be where we are right now. So thankfully, except literally other than everybody. Uh, so thankfully, we're here uh, to grin and bear it, as you will as well for the next two hours on the program. Here's what's coming up here today. Can AI do a better job of giving us an idea of what people think and voters think than the traditional methods we are using to get that information? which we're not actually using because we're just using them for psyops instead, right? Uh, we're going to get into that at the bottom of the hour. Robert Salvador is going to join us because he is hoping the answer is yes. He's going to tell us about that at the bottom of the hour. Next hour, we'll be joined by Congressman Chip Roy, one of my besties who just so happens to be in town and uh, with his four-wheel drive rental is going to be swinging by our studios at the top of next hour. So we are looking forward to that. And then for Pop Culture Tuesday, uh, at the end of the program, I will unveil my top 10 movies of 2024. We were going to debut Idolatry or Not today, but in order to accommodate Congressman Chip Roy, we're going to push that gentleman into the overtime. And there is a fascinating clip yesterday that came out of the, uh, the testimony of Anthony Fauci that was done off camera for reasons I what would be the reasons to do that off camera do you do you know that I mean, let me rephrase what would be the good reasons for doing that off camera do you know there are none no there are none so anyway she made an interesting point uh, Mar- congresswoman marjorie taylor green made an interesting point about uh, fauci's testimony that only confirms something we started telling you on this show nearly three years ago so we're going to get into that coming up in the overtime today for Blaze TV subscribers at blazetv.com slash dace. If you're not yet a Blaze TV subscriber, make sure to go there and become one so that you don't miss out on that overtime uh, conversation or any of the other exclusive content we do each day right here on Blaze TV. Also, your daily reminder coming up on January 18th, we're going to begin our first Theology Thursday series of the year. Uh, it's going to be the Bible study that we have put together, Dr. Uh, Jeremiah Johnston of Prestonwood Baptist in Dallas. He and I have put together, pardon me, a Bible study based on our film Nefarious from last year called Know Thy Enemy, a Nefarious Bible Study. We get into spiritual warfare. And if you want to get into that with us, you want to follow along with us, uh, we're going to assume in our conversations here on the show that you've already seen the videos with each chapter, because given the links of the videos, we just wouldn't have a lot of time and in the time that we have allotted to then have a conversation. So we're going to assume you've seen the videos and you get the code to the videos when you buy the book, the study guide uh, at Amazon, know thy enemy and nefarious Bible study. If you, your small group, men's group, women's group, church, you guys want to do this study with us, go through it with us. We're starting at January 18th. Get your know thy enemy Bible study today as my voice is still recovering from last night. This is the first time I have used it uh, uh, for uh, uh, projection uh, since uh, last night's uh, celebration So, uh, with the national championship game. So forgive me as I'm rehabilitating my voice here on the fly. But to go to Know Thy Enemy, uh, a nefarious Bible study in Amazon, order it there. Know Thy Enemy, a nefarious Bible study, the code for you to get access to the videos included in the study guide, and you can do the Bible study with us. I know a lot of you have never done a Bible study before. 
This is the perfect time to do your very first one. Know Thy Enemy, a nefarious Bible study available at Amazon right now. And that begins on the show on January the 18th. And with that, let us begin this show as we normally do every single one with Aaron's rundown of what happened while we were away. What happened while we were away brought to you by 2024 versus 2016. We have claimed many a time here on this show that Donald Trump of 2024 is not the same guy as the Trump from 2016. But is that true? Maybe it's time for a fact check. On January 6th of this year, just a few days ago, Donald Trump rallied in Newton, Iowa. On January 7th of 2016, Donald Trump rallied in Burlington, Vermont. For today's montage, I'm going to take 20-ish second clips from every five minutes of Trump's speeches on January 6th of this year and January 7th of 2016, up to the one hour mark in both speeches. Selecting clips from objective benchmarks like five minutes incremented time stamps in those speeches gets rid of any sort of selection bias as much as we can. And we can see for ourselves if Donald Trump looks, sounds, and is talking about fundamentally different things now than he was in 2016. We will start in 2016 with Trump's rally in Burlington, Vermont. Wow, what a beautiful group of people. Happy, healthy, beautiful. We're in Vermont. That air is so nice and clean. I'm breathing so much of that air. Now here's 2024 Trump. And a very special hello, Iowa. Happy New Year. We're going to have a great year. We got to win. We got to win. We got to win. Nine days from now, the people of this state are going to cast the most important vote of your entire lives. I believe that. 2016 Trump. Lindsey Graham. Gone. Go ahead. Governor Walker. Nice guy. Gone. These were all guys, you know, I feel guilty. Actually, I feel guilty and plenty of others. How about Pataki? He had zero. Pataki, he had zero, 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 zero. I said, at what point, you know, when do you leave when you have all zeros, right? 2024 Trump. The stakes of this election could not be higher. Under crooked Joe Biden, our borders have been absolutely erased. Millions of illegal aliens are invading from all over the world are invading. It's like a military invasion. It might as well be a military invasion. But they're invading our country. Our middle class is being crushed by Biden's crippling inflation. 2016 Trump. But he said, I'm, I'm a gifted politician. I said, maybe that's not good being a gift. I wish he just said I was gifted, left the politician out. No, I thought it was nice. He said, I'm a very gifted politician. I'm very successful, this and that. See, now, here's it. I would never say that about my opponent. I would say, my opponent has nothing going. My opponent is horrible, terrible. 2024 Trump. Uh, Nikki Haley, give me a break. I know it well. I will never run against our president, she said. I will never, ever. He is a great president. I will not run. This went on for like two years. Then one day she's making a speech. I said, oh, that's nice. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I've decided to run. What's going on? What's wrong? And DeSantis was worse because he was dead until I endorsed him. And then he went up like a rocket ship. 2016 Trump. So you go in and you say, we got to have our prisoners back before we start. They're going to say no. Because the Persians, you know, they're great negotiators. The Iranians, Persians are great negotiators. So they're going to say no, absolutely not. We're going to say bye bye. Now you leave, you leave the room. We never leave the room. How many times did we all think Obama was going to leave the room? Meaning, get his people to come out. They go back to Iran. They tell everybody that we're stupid. They're winning. This is before the deal's even done. Everyone's saying we're stupid. 2024 Trump. It's called Make America Great Again. That's all it is. It's nothing sinister. It's so sad. It's so sad. I mean, these people are more dangerous than the so-called enemy. You know, uh, China, if you're smart, you can handle China. If you're smart, you can handle Russia. I ended the Russian pipeline. He approves it. Then, I, then he says, I was soft on Russia. 2016 Trump. So when you look at a deal like that, when you see what's happening with our country, and you see that, we're going to change that. Now, as far as Iran is concerned, I saw what happened over the last few days with the embassy in Iran. The Saudi embassy. Folks, they want to take over Saudi Arabia. 
Now, they're taking over Iraq because we handed them that on a platter. 2024 Trump. In other words, we want a policy called remain in Mexico, not remain in the United States, and then nothing ever happens. And then we want another one, catch and release in Mexico. You know, we catch and release criminals, and we have them released into the United States and come back for your court case in four years. 2016 Trump. You know, like these protesters, they come in, and the only thing I like about them is that the Look at all those cameras back there. Look at all of them. Everybody's on television. But they never show the crowd. They never want to show the crowd. And the good thing about the protest, they won't turn them. In fact, I used to think that, like, they're fixed. It's a modern camera, right? So they're fixed, so you can't turn them. It's always on my face, right? 2024 Trump. I said, that's strange. That means they actually were serious that they want to have open borders. That's the first time I really believed it. And now you see the result. Millions and millions of people. Last quarter, 300,000. That's larger than probably almost all of your cities in your state. 300,000 people over actually a two-month period less. 2016 Trump. Get them out. Get them out. Get them out. Get them out. 2024 Trump. When I came in in 2015, because I actually started in 2015, I think they had a 96% approval rating, and now they have an approval rating that's lower than Congress. Can you believe that? They're in the low teens. No, the, the, the fake news media, the fake news is in the low teens now. 2016 Trump. That would be a dream come true. But actually, I must say, I have my mindset on Hillary. I do have my mindset. I have my mindset on Hillary. I mean, it's just, it's just going to be, what? We'll take it down. What does that mean? That's not us. 2024 Trump. When you look at, you know, what's happened, when you look at what they've allowed people to get away with, how they're destroying our, the fabric of our country in every way, but Washington, D.C., we're going to federalize it, take it over, make it safe. 2016 Trump. I say, how good are those windows? Sir, they can take 28 AK-47 bullets before they degenerate. I said, that's a hell of a window, right? <laughs> and then I say, how about the doors? The doors are unlimited, sir. They can take and the bottom and the top. You know, I'm driving around in an army tank. I'll never see a Rolls Royce again. <laughs> so think of it. I may never see a car that I want to be in again. 2024 Trump. So a vote for Donald Trump in these caucuses is a vote to secure our border. It's a vote to stop the invasion, the biggest invasion of our country ever. I mean, what's the difference between military? At least military, you're there. they're in front of you. You can shoot them. But these people are coming in, and then they're, the crimes they're committing are just incredible. 2016 Trump. I got, I'm on the cover of Time magazine this week. Can you believe it? I'm on, no, no. Can you believe it? No, no. Think of it. I was on the cover like five, six weeks ago, and I was honored. You know, it's still, look, we can act cool. It's still Time magazine. You're on the cover. It's pretty cool, right? 2024 Trump. And, and Liz Cheney. I mean, she has a she has a major case of Trump derangement syndrome. This I watch her on television. She's shaking. I get scared. I mean, I did knock her out of office. You know, she lost by the largest margin in history for a congressperson. 2016 Trump. So we got to get to the bottom of our problems. We've got it. We've got it. You know, we've become like. Get out of here. 2024 Trump. The press kept it going and going and going. Went for over two years. And they say, they know it's a fake, and they say he's going to prison. How bad do you have to be? 2016 Trump. How does it help us? Ford, two and a half billion dollar plant in Mexico. So they're going to make cars, trucks, and parts. They're going to bring them over the border. They'll probably be driven over the border by illegal immigrants because it's very inexpensive. No, it's true. It's true. 2024 Trump. But took her into a changing, but just think about how horrible this is. And it started because she wrote a book and she put a chapter in about this. And somebody called me and said, is this true? I said, no, it's not true. 2016 Trump. And companies like Apple to build their factories here instead of building them in China and Vietnam and all these other places. That's what I want. And we have the people that can do it. 2024 Trump. And he was saying this hospital was loaded with people. But now 
we don't have those people anymore. They said, where are they? Oh, they're in the United States. And that's what happened while we were away. Aaron's Montage, brought to you by our friends at Samaritan Ministries. Even though we are into 2024 now, it's not too late to take a look at healthcare sharing with Samaritan Ministries. It's not insurance. It's a community of Christians paying one another's medical bills. And because it's not insurance, they're not bound by open enrollment. So you can join any time of the year, even today. Uh, Check out these three reasons Samaritan Ministries could be right for you and your family. Number one. Uh, you'll be a part of a Christian community. So when you have a medical need, fellow Samaritan members send money directly to you to help you pay your medical bills, and you'll do the same for them. But even more importantly, all while praying for and encouraging one another. Second, there's no networks, which puts you in control of your family's health care. So you know what's best for them. So you get to choose the doctors and hospitals that you go to and have a say in the treatments they receive or don't. And then third, you set your own start date. So you can join today and start health care sharing with Samaritan Ministries right now or join today and choose what month you'd like to start later. It's all up to you, whether it's a broken bone, something even more serious like cancer, something joyous like a pregnancy or any medical emergency. You're going to find comfort knowing you're connected to at least 80,000 Christian households across the country who stand ready to care for one another spiritually and financially during a time it's needed most. If you want to join, this looks like something that you want to be a part of. SamaritanMinistries.org slash Steve Dace is where you can go. That's SamaritanMinistries.org slash Steve Dace. Again, SamaritanMinistries.org slash Steve Dace. So, Aaron, I'm guessing you decided to do this because there's been a bunch of talk about, obviously, Biden's decline, which is very obvious. And you can see it whenever clips show up, even from 2016 to now. OK, so Joe Biden, is that is that fair? Is sure, why we yeah. decided to do that today? Yeah. OK, so. On election day later this year, Joe Biden will be about to turn 82. He turns his birthday is November 20th, I believe. So if he'll be about to turn 82 now, <clears throat> that's assuming he'll be alive. I mean, the lifespan of an average American male right now is a little bit under white male is a little under 79 years old. So he's already surpassed that lifespan on election day later this year. Donald Trump will be 78. So write it about the lifespan. OK, um, And it's a little bit, I think when we get to the, and I, you know, hopefully I'm blessed enough to find this out, but when we get to the latter stages of life, I wonder if it's also like the early stages. It's a little bit like the difference in maturity that I see in my son at 16, he's going to be 17 next month compared to 14, just those three years. It's incredible. Right. And if you guys think back to, you know, the difference in maturity you had at 18 compared to 21 that you had a 24 compared to 21, for example, okay? So those early formative stages, three years can make a big difference. And I, I'm guessing on the on the way down the, the slope, it probably works the other right. way too. Things can deteriorate a lot from 78 to 81. Let, let's do this. <clears throat> let's all admit, or let's, I, I think we're going to all agree to this, not having discussed it before the show. I could be wrong, but I, it's pretty obvious. Everything that we saw from Donald Trump at that Iowa event <clears throat> is way beyond the level of alertness and cognitive ability that we can, oh, we are seeing from Joe Biden oh, yeah. right now. That's not even a debate. Fair? Oh yeah. Is that I mean it's that it's just to me I think it's it's beyond obvious. Fair? Yeah, yes. Okay. And 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 here's the thing if that ends up being the election we have next year or actually it's this year now if that ends up being the election we have later this year the vast majority of people are going to look at it when the time comes, if this is an issue to them, then we don't know that. I mean, it'll be, here's the thing. Is it an issue to you if you weren't already going to vote for Biden? And is it not an issue for you if you are, because these guys are just stand-ins for your ideology, regardless of their right. ability, capability, character, et cetera. And this happens on the right too. I mean, um, there is, there's there's going to be a there's there's a lot more there's a lot more articles being written in conservative media today about Susan Ransom coming out to recant her recant. All right. She's one of the Epstein girls. She is recanting her allegation that there are tapes of girls sleeping with Richard Branson. Um, uh, what was it? Uh, Bill Clinton, Donald Trump. Uh, she recanted this in 2016. 
She is recanting now her recant. She did that. Uh, was it the Daily Mail in London yesterday? Yeah, I'm not sure when that okay. originally. But aired. the story came yesterday. Yep. They printed it anyway. <clears throat> She's saying that she only recanted it in 2016 because Ghislaine Maxwell threatened her life, basically threatened her and her family. But so there's a, on the right. Are there going to be a lot more stories written about Richard Branson and Bill Clinton's allegations than the Donald Trump ones? For example, yesterday, Don Jr. went on Twitter and tweeted out an article that included Clinton and Richard Branson in the headlines. The problem is, if you read the actual article, his pops is in the article, right? So this this works comprehensively. The mm-hmm. the party idolatry, the my side's got to win. We look the other way. I, I don't. I, I just don't believe any. I you. I got into this business believing we had the moral high ground here. The last you know decade or so has completely disabused me of that notion. I I don't believe that at all. Fair. Fair. Okay, but. Whatever sliver of people that this will be part of, this would be part of their decision making process come, what is it, November 4th, November 5th? So almost exactly 10 months from now. Okay. Um, barring something unforeseen, which at this age, unforeseen things happen in your health all the time, right? right? But based on what we just saw in that clip, the level of ability between Trump and Biden, it's just not even close. Correct. Okay. Let's talk about what we saw between Trump and Trump, because this now gets into, you know, if you win, you have to do the job. Now, you're in that job for the next four years. Now, it would be the most Trump thing ever to somehow avoid 91 felony indictments, win, go through an inaugural, and then like a year in, peace out. <laughs> you know, I've proved my point. I'm going back to Mar-a-Lago. That would be about the most Trumpian thing ever, don't you think? Sure. Okay, I got scoreboard and I filled out the last line on my mantle, okay, which also indicates, by the way, if he is the nominee, this is the most important GOP um, vice presidential selection of my lifetime, I think, is who gets picked in that spot, you know, but... Prepare to be disappointed. In all things. That should, that should be your default. Just start there. And that way your expectations are low. Fair? Yeah. Okay. Here's what stood out to me, uh, comparing Trump to Trump. Physically, I didn't visually notice much of a difference. So I'm going to, I'm going to, you know, say, hey, that's Florida sunshine, vitamin D, or vitamin, that vitamin D year round. That's why people his age, wealthy or otherwise, move that, move to that place and out of places like New York at that stage of life. Uh, and not to mention the miracles of modern makeup, of which I'm guessing a billionaire has probably amongst the best money could buy where that's concerned. Right. Right. I, I didn't visually see much difference. Yeah, you I lost get, a little uh, weight. And, yeah. But yeah, overall. Yeah. More or less standard issue. Yep. The energy level was dramatically different. And and it wasn't just from him, but from the crowd. But that, that's, to me, the crucial part about all this. It's less Trump. It's the crowd. The energy level, way different. And I also thought the energy that he brought was way different. I'm going to use an analogy. You guys tell me if it's dead wrong. There, you kind of just saw Elvis and Fat Elvis. Yeah, you kind of saw you kind of saw how I'm I'm doing I'm doing Jailhouse Rock Elvis, you know, and and you know Beach Blanket, uh, you know, uh, movies with with hotties Elvis, or or maybe a better analogy is. Um, kind of when Elvis relaunched himself, what was that? 68, 69, the all black, you know, live concert that he gave, you know? Okay. There, that was, and then, but we're only like eight years, eight years later, 1976, he's dead. Okay. And he's obese and he's doing, he dies on a toilet seat. Okay. And so this, so we're eight years that we're eight years from 2016 to now. All right. So 2016, that's Elvis coming back, doing that live NBC special, wearing the all black. And he is still hit, dude, he is still hitting the notes on Hound Dog and, you know, uh, are you lonesome tonight? You know what I'm saying? I mean, it's like, that's freaking Elvis, right? Okay. And 2024, you're like, Hey, that's Elvis. And every now and then, you know, he'll hit that note on glory, glory, hallelujah or something. And people will start clapping. But everybody, most people know we're just here kind of nostalgically remembering something that's, you know, past its prime. That's the energy that I got out of that. Well, And that that might be age. But to me, it's as much circumstance as anything else. And Trump alludes to it right at the beginning of the 2016 riffs where he's just naming the corpses. Look at this guy. I just beat him. This, I mean, there's just dude energy right there. I yep. have just slayed all my opponents. Yep. On this one, this is a guy who has been 
kind of pulling a Joe Biden hiding in the basement. Mm-hmm. He has not been coming out uh, to campaign. Now, it's that's not a perfect analogy because when when he wants to go big time, I mean, this guy posts his own mugshot, for goodness sakes. So, like, I mean, when he wants to go big time, he'll still go big time. But he, he doesn't have that right now so i mean that i think i I think that plays into it as much as any uh thing else and and i think that speaks to the crowd the crowd is is very much reserved and doesn't know even if they are trump loyalists i i their footing isn't nearly as sure they're they're not cheering for a team that's just been going out there and routing people they're cheering for a team that constantly is having to i mean goodness i i just look at your shirt Right here within this season, it's the difference between Michigan today, we beat everybody, scoreboard, we right. are the national champion. But within this very same season, all the time you've had to explain, yeah, our coach has been suspended for six games. Uh, who's this Connor Stallions guy? You know, that's the difference. They're, they, they're explaining the worst a lot of times, and there's a lot of chaos going on. I think circumstances have as much to do with this as everything else. Aaron, as you put this together, what did you think? And I love the fact that you just randomly chose points of time rather than cherry picking things. I thought that was good that you did that. Yeah. So every clip was five minutes further in the respective um, speeches. And, you know, I made allowances for finishing up one point and starting the next. But um, the thing that stuck out to me, as far as issues go, it was, you know, towards the end, it was kind of Trump. Trump went on on immigration here in Iowa for a long time in that speech the other day. And then talking about E. Jean Carroll randomly at the end. But overall, on issues, you know, it's kind of the same the same stuff that he was doing in 2016. What stood out to me the most, though, is that I, I did not remember this, and I probably didn't because, you know, I was supporting Cruz at the time, is... He seemed to be having a lot of fun Mm -hmm. at those rallies. The crowd seemed to be having a lot of fun Mm -hmm. at those rallies. Mm -hmm. A lot of laughter, a lot of name and names, as Todd just said, throwing protesters out at, you know, the flick of his wrist. That was, it was kind of a powerful scene, actually. Mm -hmm. This time it's, uh, our country has gone to hell. Vote Trump. It was just, our country's in trouble. Our country's gone to hell. It was really, really negative. There was a lot of actual hope. (laughs) <laughs> just uh, by by virtue of the energy and the fun times that those rallies were and seemed to be back then, this time it was just really dire and dour. Um, and I think that's probably goes into what Todd was saying. The circumstances now are so much different uh, than they were back in, in 2016, obviously. And so I, I don't know. I don't know necessarily what that means. I think the GOP primary voter is not going to be basing their vote on this, but it was still still interesting to see nonetheless. In some respects, you know, we have talked about many times Biden being a symbol for a country. This is and I've mentioned this is the mm-hmm. first time ever that feebleness has ever been projected from the American presidency. And if we had presidents in feeble conditions, we did what we could to hide them as opposed to just put them on national TV now, right? In some respects, doesn't Trump kind of symbolize that for the opposition? Yeah, we're kind of saying the same stuff we said for many, many years. We're, yeah, but everybody knows we're not keeping our promises. Like Mike Johnson's out there today, we, you know, complaining about Mayorkas when he's out there funding Mayorkas' entire operation to allow him an invasion, that we're just kind of going through the motions here, right? One guy represents a country that's clearly in decline and projecting feebleness, that's Biden. And then in, in some respects, Trump kind of just represents a generation of resistance that's really just going through the motions. It's just kind of playing it, but isn't really serious about making a dent in the spirit of the age. Yeah, and that's what the irony with the guy who, uh, when we say he's not the same guy, he was the guy that was supposed to be shattering that paradigm. And all, now what you're saying there, now he's, he's a party ult- to it. He's ultimately the fulfillment I mean, all, all the members of, of the it. GOP House leadership you hate, all endorsed yeah. by Trump, or yeah. they have all endorsed him. Yes. I mean, I mean that, that, that he's just, a, he's, yes, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. You know, so it's, again, it's not it's not Elvis going out on tour and bringing, you know, and, and bringing this to the people. It's Elvis in Vegas for what, it, at the you know, back in that period of time would have been a lot of money, hundred dollars a seat. Yeah. You know, and it's an exclusive club of people who are still really richly devoted. But, you know, it doesn't it's not what it once was in many respects. Funny how the laws of sowing and reaping just remain undefeated no matter 
how much we like to claim otherwise or claim we are more sophisticated than the natural the laws of nature and nature's god isn't it correct more in a moment All right, back here on the Steve Day Show. You know, I've been, I've, I've, I've got to, well, I've had a hard time hearing. You guys know I'm battling back from something that caused sudden hearing loss for me back in July. I uh, went to my last update on Monday. So I went from 20% of my uh, speech, rec- all my other hearing in terms of sound recognition is good, uh, but my voice recognition is still down. So I went from 20% up to 36%, but they're, they're not sure how much better I'm going to get. Probably looking at a hearing aid as I get older. Uh, my stepfather, Jim, got him one from our friends over at MD Hearing Aids, which I may be a client here myself here in the next year or two. And he absolutely raves about it. Um, if you're still paying thousands of dollars for hearing aids that don't even work right, MD Hearing Aid is an FDA registered rechargeable hearing aid that costs a fraction of what typical hearing aids cost. MD Hearing's brand new XS model costs over 90% less than clinical hearing aids. And the XS is MD Hearing's smallest hearing aid ever fits inside your ear. No one will even know that it's there. MD Hearing, founded by an ENT surgeon who saw just how many of his patients needed hearing aids but could not afford them. So he made it his mission to develop a quality hearing aid that anyone could afford. MD Hearing Aids sold over one and a half million hearing aids. They offer a 45-day risk-free trial with a 100% money-back guarantee so that you can buy with confidence. If you want MD Hearing's smallest hearing aid ever, go to shopmdhearing.com and use the promo code Steve to get their new $397 deal when you buy a pair offer. All right, that's shopmdhearing.com. Use the promo code Steve. Shopmdhearing.com, promo code Steve. Well, a lot of times during campaigns, things can organically emerge that long outlive that particular campaign. One of those things, I think, uh, debuted, potentially debuted over the weekend. And uh, one of the the brains behind it joins us now. Robert Salvador is here with us on The Blaze. Robert, it's a pleasure, brother, to have you with us here on the show. How are you? Thanks for having me, Steve. Yeah, I appreciate it. Happy to be here and uh, great to see you. So let's start with with you, who you are. Give us kind of a quick background on Robert Salvador and how you even got into this at all. Yeah, sure. So I'm the CEO of an AI company, and we use artificial intelligence in the construction industry um, to procure billions of dollars worth of building material and supply chain items. You know, if you look around your studio, everything in there had to be procured at some point through some complicated supply chain. So we use AI for that in construction. We're one of the top companies. Um, I moved from Chicago to Miami and moved the company down there during COVID uh, just because of obviously the lockdowns. And then long story short, really just saw, you know, how the governor was running things down in Florida. I got connected with some of his team on X, on Twitter. Um, And then last year when Hurricane Ian happened, uh, we were just really inspired by the governor and his preparation and everything. So we decided to have our company donate supply chain and building material recovery items. Fast forward another year, um, got brought in and, you know, asked by the campaign just to, um, you know, participate, volunteer, um, bring in some of my tech network. And where that comes to now and with what we're going to talk about today is just from day one, I saw kind of how old school these campaigns are in their technology and in their processes. And it really was similar to what we do in construction in kind of a analog, you know, paper laden industry. Mm -hmm. So we started kind of just realizing there was a big opportunity here. Um, you know, talking about what we saw with polls and just talking about what we saw with tech in general. So I started a side project about, you know, four to six months ago. And uh, here we are today getting a great response. And hopefully, like you said, can really change, you know, the industry itself and make things better for the Americans. When you looked at the the, the current opinion survey industry, if we're going to assume that's what it is and not a psyop or a, a narrative casting industry, when you looked at it, and you looked at it as someone who has a background. Obviously, if you're working with AI, AI, you have some background with algorithms, statistics, modeling, et cetera. All right. When you, what did you see that that made you think, hey, I think this different innovation here is called for? 
Sure. Yeah. I mean, it started with just looking at the poll results and then looking at the way the media was portraying these polls. So the math behind polling and pollsters is pretty sound in that it's statistics and probability. You know, so I've made this reference before. If you have a big bowl of Skittles with all different colors, if you reach into that bowl and grab, you know, five different handfuls of Skittles and you put them on the table, do that 10 times you can pretty much measure with reasonable accuracy all the different colors of Skittles that are in the bigger bowl. That's just pure statistics. And that's what people try to do, you know, in polling and elections and whatnot. But the problem is if you don't have an actual random sample set, and also if there's anything that impacts, you know, how people are gonna respond to you, you're not gonna get an accurate, you know, sample. You're not gonna get a good poll and therefore it's kind of garbage in, garbage out, which is what we call it, you know, in the data industry. So you start looking at these polls, and the first one I posted was a Rasmussen poll that in 2007, I think it was November 2007, showed all of them wrong. Every single pollster was way off. I think they said Rudy Giuliani was going to win uh, by 10, 15, 20 points, and it ended up being John McCain, you know, who won pretty handily. So that set off some Twitter virality uh, where Rasmussen reports blocked thousands of DeSantis supporters. So then I started looking and saying, okay, you know, these polls, they're not showing us how they collect them. Mm -hmm. They're presenting things with 1.8% response rates, which basically means, you know, a very low response rate. And then they're bringing these on TV and using them to say we should cancel elections or we should not have primary debates and things like that. Mm -hmm. So I kind of just set out looking at the mechanisms that are used and there's just better ways to do it. And with technology, just like tech enables so many other industries, tech should enable polls and pollsters to be more accurate and more trustworthy, not the opposite. And, you know, we started just seeing that poll after poll either was inaccurate or they weren't being transparent or they were looking at data that, you know, just as a, a tech person, I would not consider good data. So that's why we set out to do this, you know, side project that's getting all this attention. So then explain to us why you think, see, one of the things I, I walked our audience through a lot during COVID, Robert, I didn't get accepted to my beloved University of Michigan because on the three legs of the ACT, I scored perfect on two and terrible on math. So I, they, I couldn't get admitted. OK, um, and I had to go to community college instead. So then why was I so good at COVID data? Because I don't know how to do an algorithm. But I do know how to uh, reverse engineer the assumptions of the people like you who do. Everything starts with an assumption. The idea that this math and everything all just starts in some neutral, ethereal space of called, uh, called the objective realm is not true. It has to start with some assumption somewhere. All right. And if, if the integrity of the assumptor, the one making the assumptions is bad, see Imperial College, for example, then the rest of the data will be bad and won't be able to. It'll, it'll, the fallacies will be enormous because you won't be able to reverse engineer it logically the other way. Right. And so that's how I got good at this during COVID. That's what I've been able to do throughout my career when it comes to traditional polling, for example. OK, um, it, when, when, when I used to say things, Donald Trump may lose Wisconsin, but it's not possible that he's going to lose it by 17 points, because this is the this is the claim of the internally of what they're saying is it needs to happen. Right. OK, that, th those things just won't. Th none of those things are going to happen in the nine realms of the Marvel Cinematic Universe. So clearly this isn't an, a legitimate intellectual enterprise okay so how do we avoid tainting ai with the same thing that we're avoiding just just traditional random sampling phone you know identifier email opt-in methods because ultimately human nature plays a factor here eventually yeah i mean i think you hit the nail on the head in human nature especially in 2023 is people don't tell others who they vote for you know it's become you know very odd to talk about at the dinner table and it can be you know very controversial but if you look at the things that people say and do in their data and in their digital footprint many times that's more accurate than you know what they're going to tell someone you, you bring up a good example so using covid right I say about polls in 2023 that polls right now are used like COVID death charts were mm -hmm. during the lockdowns mm -hmm. to justify the lockdowns. Mm -hmm. They're lying with statistics. And you can still do that same thing. But during COVID, what happened was people would go out and they'd say, yeah, I'm masking. Yeah, I'm vaxxed. But behind the scenes, a lot of people were like, this makes no sense. I don't believe in any of right. this. Blah, blah, blah. Right. And if you look at social media, 
the narratives there, the data points behind that, the digital breadcrumbs kind of showed that for many people. And so I liken what your question is. So about, this you know, is a key to, point. This is a key point. People, social media, how you behave on social media is the thing in which Robert will catch the conscience of the king here, to paraphrase Shakespeare. You can claim whatever you want. You can say out loud whatever you want. But the stuff you click on, this is why Google knows what ads to put up on, your, on the articles you read. All right. The stuff you click on, once that data imprint becomes public, t- t- that, those are, as you put it, the breadcrumbs of what you really think as opposed to what you'll just opt in and say, or maybe not opt in or say whatsoever. Yeah, I mean, I liken it to getting a a gift for Christmas. You know, your aunt asks you what you want for Christmas. You say, oh, some electronics, oh, what kind? And then maybe you get something you actually want. You go on Amazon Prime and they literally know to the specification, to the memory card of the, you know, digital camera or whatever it is that you wanted. And that's because your data, the data points on you are everywhere. And it's not just you, you know, going back to the statistics uh, metaphor we made earlier about the bowl of Skittles with all the rain, if you can get a random sample there, even if they don't have, if we, for example, don't have your data to, you know, make a profile on you or whatnot, you can make profiles and then generalize them using statistics. So you could find someone who's very similar to Steve in Mm -hmm. characteristics and Mm -hmm. things that they believe. And even if you don't have Steve's data, you can make an assumption as to what Steve might likely believe. And so what we did was we took the online sentiment, you know, all the digital breadcrumbs, and then we combined it with some traditional polling methods, but we also enabled them with tech. So it wasn't just cold calls. It was also automated text message. It was outreach on social media. And then we fed both of those into an algorithm that basically scored how likely we think someone is to, you know, vote for someone. So basically modeling the outcome of the election based on those pieces of criteria is what you did. Yeah. So we're filling in more color with the polls that currently exist. People don't answer their landline anymore if they even have a landline. Right. But if you can get to someone and then color their profile in with more data, you're going to have a much better idea of who they are, you know, how they're going to vote. And you can go from there. And again, I just believe that if these polls are going to be taken on TV and used to represent democracy, then transparency and accuracy and Mm -hmm. efficiency should be the number one thing for this And where an AI comes in is the ability to accumulate all of that mass data and those breadcrumbs in ways that if you did this all, just building your own database, for example, would take armies and streams of of people and years of of time to to go ahead and, and do. Basically, it's what companies like Google and others do for the left in America all the time. That's what you're trying to 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 emulate on the right. Yeah, I mean, I think that's a great point. You know, the left has tech like this in droves, fully integrated. I mean, we saw it back, you know, ever since even before 2016, really going back to 2008, uh, Obama was the first really, you know, digital, but they have, you know, you have to realize Silicon Valley is left leaning. There's a whole political market of the best tech companies, the best tech founders who work on this technology for the left. You know, I am fortunate to be, you know, backed by some of those same companies, but ideologically, I'm a Republican. I don't see it that way. So I came in and saw, wow, the Republicans, the conservative movement is using, you know, spreadsheets and paper laden processes. There's no way we're going to win elections at the national level if we're not, you know, equipped with this. So, yeah, exactly. That's why we decided to do this poll. And that's why I think the technology in general, I hope this can be an example to conservatives that we need these things. No matter who happens to win the primary, if we want to have a chance in the general, um, you know, we need these things. So the one other thing I'll say is just going back real quick to a point you made about the digital. I want to take an example from our poll because people might think, like, why is it showing differently? So. You know, you can release, we release some data on the the numbers themselves for the traditional poll. But then the other piece is the algorithm that does, you know, all the digital things. One of the things I want to point out is I think there is an over, I wouldn't say an oversampling, but DeSantis, as an example, is a good representation in our poll on how an algorithm like this can take in what big media is saying, but also what like the smaller voices online and the online sentiment are saying Mm -hmm. and make its own prediction. Mm -hmm. So if you look at DeSantis, even in 2022, his governor reelection, he was, you know, under poll. They said that he'd win by five to 7%. We consume some of the data going back to that. And even then it looked way higher for him. We probably would have went 10 to 15%, you know, he was up. Same thing here. 
it looks like DeSantis has a lot more support than traditional media and traditional pollsters are showing. And in old school methodology, you know, the traditional polls, that's hard to show. And that's where a digital tool like this can unlock new insights to hopefully give better data. And so in this example, you're seeing that, yeah, the CNNs of the world might be saying it's all terrible for DeSantis, but the sentiment we're seeing across keywords, across social media, across you know Google pages is actually much better than that. And so that's why you see him represented you know, much stronger than in the traditional polls. All right, so we, we flashed while you were talking the results of your, of your first model, which is basically a beta, for lack of a better description. So you're, I know you're planning on tweaking some things before you, kind of your final projection comes out, I believe, on Sunday, the 14th, right before the caucuses. Uh, I've, got, um, I've got 90 seconds here. What, what's the, what, give me, can you tell us a little bit about what you plan on tweaking between now and then? Yeah, so I think the first thing was we sampled independence too high. One of the reasons we did that um, was because we wanted to get a wider net, both for, for the digital side of things, because in order for us to train the model, you know, you have to have a broad sample of, you know, what are these words people are saying and what are the keywords. So in our poll, I think we went a little bit too high in independence. So we will scale that down a little bit. Um, also, we're going to release, you know, more information just on how the traditional poll was collected. I think, you know, there was a bunch of people asking that. Um, we're going to release, we'll try and release more info on the algorithm. It's a little bit difficult because an algorithm is computer code and it's a little bit more complicated than mm -hmm. just saying, hey. And proprietary. You know, yeah. yeah, but uh, the sample size and then but from there, like I said, from day one, you know, we wanted this to be transparent. So we were going to release it no matter what it shows. So, yeah, two things for the next poll. Uh, definitely have a bit more um, specificity on the traditional methods and then make some tweaks on, on independence. And then, yeah, we'll do polls every couple of weeks, you know, no matter what happens in Iowa. Um, we just think this is something that, you know, is good for the party, good for America. And, uh, you know, go from there. I think this has. If and this is the thing we're going to find out, can you actually do this? OK, can you pull it off? But if you can do this, I think this has tremendous benefits uh, to our side moving forward beyond this cycle, uh, particularly at the grassroots level. I, I saw with my own eyes with to, with, with, with to people like uh, Brad Parscale, who have who who's, does a lot of this kind of work, too, with what they were what he was able to do with this kind of data and AI stuff uh, for helping nefarious uh, my film uh, become profitable in the in the PVOD window. I've, I've seen firsthand the power of this kind of data. So here's hoping you can pull it off, Robert. So we have an excuse to bring you back here and keep talking about it. All right. Thank you. Thanks, Steve. Appreciate you having me. You bet. Any real quick thoughts here? We've got 30 seconds. Uh, lawyer up, because if you're successful at this in a world oh, where yeah. they arrest moms <clears throat> on playgrounds oh, for yeah. breathing free air, but they let Palestinian protesters shut down traffic, they're not just going to let you do this. Oh, yeah. That's a great point. Indeed. Chip Roy will join us next. Back here with Hour 2 here on Blaze TV, radio, and podcast. Steve Dace here with Todd Erz and Aaron McIntyre. And all of you, and you can let us know what you think about what we think, via the SteveDace.com inbox. Do that by emailing the show, Steve at SteveDace.com. That's D-E-A-C-E. -E. Like us on Facebook, me, we, and Gab. You can follow me at Steve Dace Show on Twitter, Gitter, Instagram, and TikTok. And then if you listen via the podcast version, we love you so much, please. If you wouldn't mind sharing whether or not you love us with the world, we'd appreciate it with a five-star review on whichever podcast platform you utilize. And we thank all of you who have done that. This year, our goal is to get over 10,000 five-star reviews uh, to eclipse that mark on iTunes this year if we can. I know we're over 9,000. So that's our hope to be able to do that this year. Also, make sure to hit subscribe or follow. And that way, every time we do a new episode, it shows up in your podcast feed every single time. And thanks to all of you that have done that for us as well. Uh, this part of the show brought to you by our friends over at Miracle Made. You know, I raved about the Miracle Made sheets last summer. We had uh, one of the hottest summers in uh, recent memory uh, here in Iowa last year. And these temperature regulating sheets were just outstanding. I mean, I think I told you guys it's the first time ever 
um, that we, we've lived in the same home for 17 years now, and this is the first time ever I wasn't running the ceiling fan to help to supplement the AC at night uh, because of how great these sheets were. So how do they perform right now when we're having a terrible winter storm? Man, I slept like a rock last night okay i mean these sheets are absolutely phenomenal self cooling properties for better quality sleep uh miracle made offers a whole line of self cleaning sheets as well they're the same it's the same silver infused fabric does the exact same thing helps to keep them self uh, t- regulating from a temperature standpoint self cleaning as well and Hey, listen, there's other things that you could sleep in that do that. Like you could sleep in aluminum foil. That would probably do the same thing. All right. That's not going to be very comfortable. These sheets are also, dare I say, if it's a risk of violating the Duke code, they're very comfy. They're comfy sheets too. Highly would recommend upgrade your sleep with Miracle Made. Try MiracleMade.com slash Dace. That's the website. Try Miracle.com slash Dace. That's the website. Again, try Miracle.com slash Dace. And you, if you do, in order today, you'll save over 40%. And if you use my promo code Dace, you'll get three free towels and save an additional 20% at checkout. You can't beat it. Try Miracle.com slash Dace, promo code Dace. Trimiracle.com slash Dace, promo code Dace. <clears throat> we welcome in now Congressman Chip Roy is here with us. Man, it is, it, I can't believe it's like you're a real person for once. How you been, man? What's hey, it, going is on? Great. it is great to be here. It is great to see you guys in person. Uh, and it's great to be in Iowa. It's, it's great to be driving around the, the snow. I, a little bit of, uh, you know, re- remembering my youth a little bit of driving the snow. We don't get this in Austin very much. Wish my kids were here to see it. And wish my Longhorns had been there being able to play, uh, play you guys last night. But it was a good game. And uh, I mean, Washington deserves. The, the win against Texas they, they, they won that one but uh, but a uh, good game for about three quarters but you guys uh, put the heat to them there at the end we did our best to make it a good game and let yeah. them hang around it should <laughs> what happened in the fourth quarter should have happened in the first quarter yeah. if you watch that yeah. and we just didn't finish and, and credit to them I mean they're 14-0 yep. for a reason they're yep. a tough team I think they had won more games by fewer than 10 points mm-hmm. than any team in college yeah, football yeah. history so yep. uh, but uh, I mean tremendous no doubt about it one of the reasons why my voice still hasn't recovered uh, is I'm still uh, coming back uh there was a little exuberance in the dace man cave last night yeah, watching that I bet game. there was but i was sorry we were stuck on the road we got, i was supposed to i was going to try to come see it with yep. you and we were but we were campaigning and we were uh, driving pretty slow down the highway last night in the snow so so you've seen you've seen parts of iowa that i haven't even seen in a while here in the last week or so i want to talk about that and i certainly want to talk about the latest betrayal out of congress okay yeah. but if you will indulge me sitting to your right all right is is our good friend todd erzin great american and he is and and todd has said on this show many times over the years that he is tempted to run for congress just to see if he could get elected number one but then more so and i don't want to put words in your mouth todd so so when i throw it to you feel free to correct me more so to find out what is it really like is it really is it is everybody really just this weak is it is it this hard to avoid temptation, to not just lose your soul. I mean, more of more of like intellectual curiosity yeah. to you more than anything else, right? I I got to know, as <laughs> right? Steve Dace just said, there's a uh, the Grisham book turned movie, The Rainmaker, which Coppola actually directed, and there's this great scene where John Voight is playing the uh, hoity-toity. Uh, 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 attorney who's just using and abusing the young Matt Damon uh, attorney, and. At one point, Matt Damon decides to take some of the leverage back and just says straight to John Voight's face, do you even remember when you first sold out? And that's, I want to know amongst the 435 in Congress, how many does that apply to directly? Because I asked you when you got in here, how many of these people can you... Are, are you still able to deal with on just a fundamental human level or is it all just some cyborg cultish algorithm? No, you know, it really is interesting. Yeah, Thomas Massey and I were out on the campaign trail, so we had a lot of time on the on the bus. We were talking about this. We talked about it a little bit with Governor DeSantis, who obviously served in Congress and helped found the Freedom Caucus, one of the many reasons I support him. Uh, and, and I'll get to it in a minute, but I want to preview. What's lacking in Washington is leadership. Um, that's just it. I mean, and it's been lacking in Washington for decades. I mean, you got to go back to Ronald Reagan, I think, I mean, the last time when we had true, serious leadership to transform the place. 
Most people who go to Washington, most of our Republican colleagues, I think, go there with the right intent. They're good people. Um, look, we have a lot of faithful people, a lot of prayerful people, uh, a lot of people who believe in the principles we espouse, the principles you guys talk about, we talk about on this show, limited government, cutting spending, cutting the bureaucracy. But when it comes to push comes to shove, they always find the excuse to revert to the mean, and that mean is to continue to expand government under some excuse. That's the problem fundamentally. So last year we were transforming the place, right? After the speaker's fight in January, we got a fantastic bill with the Limit Save Grow, which was a modest increase in the debt ceiling for serious transformative change. We got HR2, the best border security bill we've ever passed. Uh, we got a good national defense bill with serious reforms to focus it on the military. We got seven appropriations pills. We got 1,100 amendments passed on, a pro or voted on, I should say, voted on, uh, uh, during the appropriations process, which we haven't done in decades. We were actually transforming the place. Credit to Speaker McCarthy. Didn't do everything I wanted to do. A lot of issues there. But credit, we were changing it. And what I found was some of the old guard appropriators and the old bulls, they were fine with going as conservative as we could take it. They just need to be pushed. They need leadership to give them direction to go there. Unfortunately, the powers that be, uh, they just decide to revert to the easiest place to land. And let me be very clear. All five Republican leaders have endorsed Donald Trump because it's the easiest place to land. It's the place where you... Like, you I, I knew Mike Johnson was going to sell us out on the budget when he went on CNBC and did an interview. No one asked for his endorsement. Nobody cared. Most people didn't even know who he was. And he goes on there to say Donald Trump had, quote, the greatest economy of all time of all time. And so I came on the show, the, did I not? The next day I said, I guarantee you, he will, the next thing he will do is sell us out on the budget. He painted the elephant's blood over the door chip. All right. And the angel of accountability will now pass over. He, it, it says Trump in elephant's blood on his door. And now he can say and do whatever he wants. That's kind of what you're talking about. It is. And, and look, I, you know, this is the thing that you're getting at about, all right, what do you do? You go there. Can you get along with these people? Can you look at some of these folks are great folks that I get along with. I consider friends, but we got to speak truth, right? I represent 750,000 Texans. Our country needs transformative change or we're going to lose it. There is no more room for this sort of, well, you know, I just, I just don't want to make my colleague mad. Like, I'm sorry. Do you know how many times I've gotten text messages, phone calls, or glares in, on Capitol Hill or over Christmas since I've been pounding away right before Thanksgiving. I gave a fairly uh, notable speech on the floor in which I said, name one thing Republicans right. have done. I've been getting chastised by my colleagues for that. And you know what I keep telling them? There is one easy solution if you have a problem with that. Do something. And I've gotten more text messages from the speaker, from other people saying, you're making our job hard. You're making our job difficult. Well, cry me a river if I'm making your job hard. Because you know what? We're supposed to deliver for the people. Look, I still remain optimistic that there's something going on in this country. The Riley Gaineses of the world, the Chloe Coles of the world, the Scott Smiths in Loudoun County, the Mark Houks in Philadelphia, people that are actually grabbing the mantle of freedom. Man, I am so inspired being out on the road in Iowa with Ron DeSantis, meeting with Iowa. Ones, uh, listening to what um, he has to say, but importantly, listening to what they have to say. People who love this country. Uh, I've been truly actually uplifted being in Iowa. I love Texas, uh, but man, good folks here. I'm not trying to you know win votes by saying this. I'm saying uh, uh, my friend Jason Johnson, we were driving around and uh, we we're noting like seeing people work, seeing young kids working, seeing families and homeschooled families coming to these events and their kids are working and they fear the Lord. Um, this is this is the state that can save this country this year. Hey man, agreed. One last thing on this, then Todd, tell me if you're satisfied before we get to contemporary issues. Whether it was Todd or anybody in our audience, if they were to get elected, what would be the first, the, or what would be the most surprising thing to them from the inside? Uh, two things that I think mirror what I was trying to say before. One, you would be surprised at the goodness and the good intentions of a lot of our members of Congress, and that should inspire you and make you happy in our Republican form of government. You would be absolutely devastated at the extent to which they will capitulate at the first sign of any kind of opposition or a tweet against them or some mean look by, say, Donald Trump or somebody at home or somebody tweeting against you. I am blown away. Extent, you know, and Thomas and I will talk about that, right? We've taken on President Trump. And I remind people, my former boss, Rick Perry, who fairly notably came up, was campaigning here in Iowa. In 2016, he called President Trump a cancer. He ended up being his secretary of energy. Right. Like I got a call from a New York Times reporter yesterday wanting, wanting to ask me about what will happen to Kim Reynolds if Trump wins the caucus, as I said, nothing. 
Right. Nothing. Trump if Trump is a consummate politician. If he needs her to win the general election in Iowa, seven electoral college votes, none of, none of this was going to matter. You know, Nothing. Go- Governor DeSantis on the stump, and I'll do the qu- very quick version. He'll talk about all the monuments on the left side of the plane when you fly into D.C., right, looking at the memorials and looking at Capitol Hill and looking at the Washington Monument. And on the right side of the plane, you look out and you see those 400,000 uh, similarly uh, shaped symmetrical tombstones across Arlington National Cemetery. Uh, they all had to you know, give the last full measure of devotion. They uh, gave their lives or they at least risked their lives and ended up being interred there. Uh, they had to face bullets. Like, if all I got to do is face some mean tweets exactly. or somebody saying something mean about me, like, that's not that big of a deal. And that's, I think, to answer your question, it would surprise you the extent to which politicians wilt in the face of some negative statement or, oh, my God, Chip, you don't understand. We can't get that done. How many times do I get That's more discouraging than corruption. Weakness is more discouraging than corruption because yeah. I can just make it. Maybe we can come up with a better offer to buy right, off right. your you affections. Can off, I can't right. overcome the fact you're just that weak of a person. Yeah, and they'll say, well, Chip, we don't have the Senate. We don't have the White House. But you know what will happen next year? What will they say? Chip, we don't have 60 votes in the Senate. Right. Like, you just We don't have all nine Supreme Court justices. Yeah. Right. You know what you do? And people were asking me on this campaign trail about Governor DeSantis. What would you do right there on day one? do right instead of president trump sitting around counting how many people were on the mall remember that the first oh, week I of remember his presidency well. <laughs> oh oh my god we had more people on the mall they were lying that should have been the first giveaway that we were going to then capitulate on obamacare not actually repeal it not replace it not fix the border not actually get the wall built and have mexico pay for it not actually have a health care freedom empower fauci you know knock out another eight trillion dollars of debt you know, put people in the corner and shut down schools and make them wear masks and make them get vaccine mandates. If that's winning, I don't want winning. I want the kind of winning we've seen out of Governor DeSantis in Florida. All right. Are you satisfied? Well, with, with, my, with, my heart is still broken, but uh, I, this man is okay. superhuman in terms of his ability to withstand that. All right. Let's get to the contemporary issues mm-hmm. then now. Let's start with the campaign trail. You've been around the state. What are you seeing? Well, we have, we have been all over the state um and it has been absolutely uplifting extraordinary the energy is significant uh i am i'm being as objective as i can be and you're very good at this but trying to objectively analyze to my own detriment most times probably probably (laughs) um i i I, look there's an uphill climb here you know Mm -hmm. like you've got a media that's against you i would note for example i think i hope today we're going to get a correction on this fox ran a graphic yesterday i was saying he's only been to half the counties right right i mean this is the kind of thing that's emblematic of the kind of example for your listeners right they put up a graphic saying he'd only been to like you know uh you know x i think 650 counties and done 99 events yeah. well, that's wrong he's been to all 99 counties and he's done something like 200 plus 220 240 events yeah i know i've been to a lot of them and uh look the people on the ground they get it when i talk about my 14 year old son and my 12 year old daughter i talk about how they were uplifted coming up here and being on the campaign they want to be here and can't be there at home in school and they've got their 4-h goat show this friday so we're going to try to get them up but the weather may not let it happen but um you know they are why i'm in congress right when i got through cancer uh through stage three hodgkin's lymphoma my daughter was four months old my son was not two um i promised myself i was going to fight to save this country for them and i want them to be able to look up to the guy or gal in the white house but not just for the sake of it i want them to be able to look up to the guy and the gal in the white house because of who they are and what they're doing And Governor DeSantis is the only guy I've seen in my lifetime, or going all the way back to Ronald Reagan, that I can be extremely excited about not just who he is, but what he's doing. Not just what he's doing, but who he is. All of that together is what leadership actually looks like. And on the campaign trail, people are seeing that. They're responding to that. They get it. They get when I compare and contrast the records, right? They understand it. And frankly, they haven't heard it a lot. Because a lot of Republicans are unwilling to say, President Trump did a lot of great things. I can say that he did good stuff on the border, that Tom Homan, the head of ICE, is a friend of mine, that Mark Morgan, the head of Border Patrol under Trump, is a friend of mine, that the OMB director under Trump, Russ Vogt, is a friend of mine, that we worked together, we would work together again, that they did some things to stick their fingers in the dike, remain in Mexico. That's awesome. But you know what you could have done? You could have signed the executive order ending birthright citizenship, but you didn't do it. You could have actually fought Paul Ryan when Paul Ryan and the Wall Street Journal and the Chamber of Commerce said you need to have an amnesty bill. And instead, you you uh, you could have uh, gone with the uh, conservative bill that Ron DeSantis went with with the Freedom Caucus to say we need less amnesty or no amnesty and more security. He didn't do that. He chose the amnesty approach. Guess what? We failed. We didn't pass legislation. 
He could have taxed remittances to Mexico and paid for a wall. He didn't do that. He could have blocked any one of the 12 continuing resolutions that he then supported, even though they weren't giving him the funding for the wall. He didn't do that. He let him get away with it. He could have stood up for health care freedom. He could have fought John McCain and Paul Ryan and Mitch McConnell to give us a repeal of Obamacare. We didn't do that. He could have not empowered Fauci. He could have not shut down the greatest economy in the history of the world. These are a lot of things he could have done. So yet he gets exalted as somehow being somebody who's infallible. Meanwhile, Governor DeSantis delivers across the board, sends a plane load of people to Martha's Vineyard, transforming the entire election in the fall of uh, 2022 by leading. When everybody said, if you do that, you'll lose Hispanic voters. What happened? He won by a million and a half votes and he won 62% of Hispanic voters. That's what leadership looks like. And he wins when he does it. Takes on Disney. Hey, they say, you can't do that. He wins by a million and a half votes. Right. So the, uh, the people on the campaign trail, when they hear all of that, we have been converting almost everybody we talk to. Um, the, a man that was uh, supporting Vivek, when I walked him through all of Vivek's flip flops, I'm like, look, he says great things. I love what he's out there saying about DEI and about climate change. But I don't love what he was saying a couple of years ago about vaccines or what he was saying about, you know, covid lockdowns. Right. It matters. Leadership matters. You want to know why you're frustrated with Washington? Because you keep electing people and choosing people who aren't going to do the job. How about we do something different? And that message is resonating, Steve. You kind of answered the question I was going to ask next, but I'm going to ask it anyway, because maybe the way I'll frame it will will cause you to come up with something you didn't just itemize and maybe look at it from a bigger picture standpoint. Okay. You don't need to be doing this. I mean, you you are, if, if, you know let me just be blunt because you and I are good friends and have been for several years. So I, I think I can be, you are one of the few that is literally in the mix of virtually every meaningful fight on a daily basis. You, you don't need to take on another conflict. And if you had chosen not to enter into this, no one would have said, Hey, where's chip Roy at? Because you just would have been in another fight. I mean, this, you'd be in DC right now, arguing against uh, your own speaker is where right. you would be if you weren't here. So you don't need this. You don't need the baggage of this. You don't need loyalists uh, for the former president, your own district, you know, to be harassing you about why are you doing this and being disloyal and all that other stuff or the former president threatening you with a primary or anything of that nature. You don't need this. You've got plenty of other places that would not be nearly as radioactive where you could channel your time and energy from a conflict standpoint. Why invest it here? Um. You're right that I alluded to it before, but let me frame it this way. I, and I want to repeat the part about our kids because that's all that matters. You're a father. Mm-hmm. Um, it, you and I both have a faith in the Lord Almighty that we are comfortable in knowing our futures, regardless of this brief moment of time here on this planet. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, Keith Rothfuss, who was a former member of Congress, is out stumping for the governor. And uh, Casey and, the, and, he, and Keith and I were out stumping yesterday because the governor is in Florida, right? He was delivering the state of the state this morning. He has a job. And so uh, we noted Casey all of a sudden realized all three of us were cancer survivors Mm -hmm. and pointing out the extent to which that informs your thinking, right? Informs why all of this now takes on a different worldview, because you realize our time on this planet is very brief. I don't care what Alex, what's his nuts or any of these people out there on social media Mm -hmm. uh, say about me. I don't care, right? I'm going to come and go. I'm going to be pushing up daisies and, you know, a couple, three decades or tomorrow, depending on when the Lord calls me home. I want to invest every ounce of my energy uh, fighting for this country. And I actually, as angry as I get on the floor, I do it to try to get people to understand what's going on. And I am angry about it. But I'm a happy warrior inside because I know that I've got a place in heaven and the good Lord's got a place for me because I believe in his son. Mm -hmm. Um, But Governor DeSantis understands his place. That matters. You can't be a good leader. And the Bible shows you this repeatedly. If you don't know your place. And he understands and he'll say it. He'll say there is only one ruler. He's not running to be a ruler. He's running to be a servant. There is one ruler and that is the Lord Almighty. And he gets that. He doesn't wear it on his sleeve. He's not out there proselytizing. He's running for president. But it matters that you're humble, that you're, you've got that humility, that you check that hubris over here, but you're confidently leading. So to answer your question... There is no, uh, nothing more important right now than ensuring that we have the leadership in this country to try to preserve freedom and Western civilization against an attack on our entire way of life. It's not about saving America per se. It's about saving freedom. 
It's about saving the ability to live free because if you live free, you have the ability to go out and let more people understand and know the gospel of Jesus Christ. You have the ability to go prosper and have other people prosper Mm -hmm. as we've demonstrated. So that's what this is about. And I, I'm going to sit here and tell you, if, if if Donald Trump is our nominee, we very much risk losing the election this fall. And if Democrats have that, and we'll lose the House and the Senate if that happens. If Democrats have the House and the Senate and the White House, this country is over. So you better go try to figure out how to live free because they will destroy the Supreme Court. They will absolutely try to make, you know, D.C. a state. They will try. So what to- you're telling me is either Ron DeSantis is going to be president or governor at even a larger state than he currently is because the amount of people are going to have to move there, basically. I mean, this is what we're this is what's at stake. And so this is why I'm putting every ounce of my being into backing a guy who you can fully trust and believe in to deliver, but know who he is. And that matters. And it matters for our kids and our grandkids. Um, We always say these things about what's at stake is the most important election of our lifetime. But what truly is at stake is is a is a battle of good versus evil and our ability to live free as human beings the whole experiment as the as the governor goes out and campaigns about you know a republic if you can keep it as ben franklin famously said walking out of independence hall that is what this is about are we going to keep the republic are we going to prove that people can govern themselves are we going to prove that that model works or are we going to bow down at the altar of empowering tyrants we should never do that we should put every ounce of our being, and as the, as the governor says, be, be, be willing to wear the uniform, be able to do whatever it takes to give that last full measure of devotion, to put it all on the line for our, uh, our kids and grandkids to live free. I got about five or six minutes left with yep. Congressman Shiproy here. Let's, let's dovetail this into the conversation about Congress, yeah. what's going on there, why you chose to be here instead of Congress today. You started last year by working on uh, an effort to to vacate the chair to challenge Kevin McCarthy's speakership for someone that you thought would be a better, more principled, effective speaker. And to that end, got some concessions out of him. Mm -hmm. And then ultimately, one of your colleagues that helped you uh, drive that effort to last January, uh, Matt Gaetz, um, issued another, uh, you know, uh, uh, vacating of the chair this fall. That was approved, and he was, and Kevin McCarthy was replaced, uh, ostensibly because he was going to essentially codify the permanent debt bomb that it looks like Mike Johnson is about to codify and just cut the deal with Charles Schumer with, which is exactly what we got rid of Kevin McCarthy for. Are you prepared or contemplating repeating this January, which you did last January, filing for a motion to vacate the speaker in response? to i i don't know how else to describe this it's just a betrayal of the country i don't i mean is that melodramatic i don't think it is it's not melodramatic i i don't know uh you know it will be able to see you know people be able to see i've got this out there on my social media okay there's a graphic showing you the level of spending and so just go look at my social media and see it but what you'll see when you look at that right is we're talking about a 1.66 trillion dollar spending bill which is about 36 billion over the nancy pelosi omnibus bill from a year ago that we all violently opposed because it propped up the entire bureaucratic state which is massively higher than what we were fighting for last year when we tried to return spending simply to pre-COVID levels at $1.471 trillion. Um, We have an off-ramp right now from the caps that we achieved last year that would enable us to at least exit at about $1.56 trillion. Um, That would be a win. It would be a significant win. But to answer your question and go back, and I'll I'll modestly correct it, a year ago almost exactly, what we were engaged in was a debate about who should be the speaker who had not been chosen yet. So we had not vacated because there was no speaker. There was a debate. There were 20 or so uh, of varying numbers. The ability to vacate actually came out of the agreement you guys made. That's right. Yeah, Yeah. we were fighting to maintain the ability to vacate. We were fighting to get concessions about how decisions would be made. And on the upside, for all the listeners out there, we were massively successful as an entire conference, as Republicans, because of what we did for about six months. Unfortunately, a bad deal was cut. They reverted to the mean uh, Memorial Day. But even that bad deal that we lambasted, the reason I didn't support vacating after it was because because of our work, it was better than it would have been. We got caps in place, and I wanted to use those caps and try to constrain the spending even further. Kevin was including us at the table. We were having some success. We got seven appropriations bills passed, 1,100 amendments, all of these things that were transforming the way the House was working. I thought that was worth fighting to continue to improve because transformation doesn't happen overnight. 
at least not without a strong leader in the White House like a Ron DeSantis. I think he could be fairly immediate in that transformation. But in a body of 435, it takes some work. I was happy to sit down. To, I gave. We conceded on certain issues. But then fast forward, and we had vacate this fall. I publicly disagreed with that. I thought it took us off the rails of the direction we were going as a group. And I think that's borne out. I think the You basically evidence, thought it was firing the head coach in the third quarter. Correct. Let's finish the game. Right. Finish okay. the game. And if finish we the lose season. the game, fire right. the coach. Right. Then yeah. go get a new coach and figure yeah. it out later. I thought we were in the process. Let's go finish it. Well, I think that's borne out. I think we, we changed it and we've gotten the same result or worse. And so this bill is garbage. Okay. It is garbage. It does not secure the border. No concessions. Because you'd have to make some deals, right? So, so, uh, so do we get anything meaningful out of this at all? Well, we will know when they negotiate the riders, right? The policy riders that would get stuck in there. I am not uh, optimistic based on what they just negotiated on the national defense bill that extended FISA for 16 months and mm-hmm. basically got rid of all of our DEI and CRT stuff. Mm-hmm. So I don't think they would succeed. Uh, I'll, I'll re- reserve judgment. If they totally botch it, we get no policy reforms and we're spending at $1.66 trillion, I don't know why we would keep him as speaker. I just got to be honest. I don't know why we would do that. Um, I'm leaving it on the table. Uh, I'm not going to say I'm going to go file it tomorrow. I'm not, cause I'm not saying I'm not going to file it tomorrow. Um, I think the speaker needs to know that we're angry about it. Uh, he needs to know that we need to sit down at the table and try to solve this. Um, but now we've got on the table, we've got the border negotiations and all of these other issues going on. But the bottom line is, I want to also clarify the reason I'm here is my flight was canceled this morning. I was supposed to fly back to D.C. this morning, uh, but because the weather was canceled, so I'll get on a flight later or tomorrow um, to try to get back for votes. But um, the bottom line is, We've got to hold the line. You go, but let's go back to where you started this. All the people out on the campaign trail. Mm-hmm. Do you know how many Iowans that I don't represent came up and said, thank you for what you're doing. You're giving us hope. Mm-hmm. You know, saying it to Thomas Massey, too. And Thomas, I don't agree on everything. Mm-hmm. You don't have to agree on everything, to your point. Um, what you got to do is agree on the direction you want to go. Right. Put a target on the wall and go there and then let's all work together to get there. This is not doing that. And I want to put it in stark terms. Mike Johnson came in and he said, oh, we should do a uh, continuing resolution at Nancy Pelosi levels. I got mad at that. I said that was a bad thing. He said, don't worry, we'll go deal with the NDAA. Then we do the NDAA, the National Defense Bill. We get rid of most of our good riders, cleaning it up and focusing on the mission. Got and we get FISA go ahead. for 16 months. Then what? Then he goes, oh, we'll go fight on spending. Now he wants us to do $1.66 trillion. He says, Chip, the real fight is border. we got to get the border done, and I'm doing that on Ukraine. You know what we'll get? $60 billion of Ukraine and bullcrap border security. Yeah. So I'm not in. I'm fighting that. We've got less than a minute here. Anything you guys want to say in reaction what you heard from Chip before we say goodbye to him? <laughs> That last part is the answer you should have gave me to my first question because it sums up everything. Uh, yeah, the, the, that's what I don't I don't believe that the direction they have for our children, and that's the point you mentioned, that our children is fundamentally what the four of us are about. Aaron? Same. Yeah, I, I mean, at the end of the day, you are either a fighter or you're not. You're either a fighter or a pushover. That's really, there are two types of people. And I think what Chip just ar- articulated is uh, that it exists in D.C. as well, maybe more so than anywhere else. And they're just very few fighters. Man, I was really hoping you're going to tell us they were just that corrupt. It'd be easier, wouldn't it? Corruption is easier to overcome than cowardice. Yes. Yeah. But look, here's the deal. Last thing, optimistic. We've got a good group there in the Freedom Caucus and others. We are in transforming things. Last year was not lost. Okay. We we, we only passed like 34 bills last year. That's a win. We were fighting on our side of the field. We have held free uh, spending in check. Thank you, brother. More in a moment. God bless. All right. Now that they're gone, before we get to Pop Culture Tuesday, any thoughts on the conversation we just had with Chip Roy and that I'm actually depressed to hear that cowardice is more of a problem than corruption. I was just hoping it was just good old fashioned. People are being bought off because then there's a plan, right? If people are being bought off, then someone's buy- doing the buy-in and someone's ultimately in charge. You know, it's scarier than a shadowy group of people you don't see a deep state being in charge. You know, what's even scarier than that. No one's in charge. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. No one's in charge to me is scarier than the deep state is in charge thoughts on what we just discussed with chip roy before we do pop culture tuesday both of you i'm firmly in agreement uh, with you the the level of 
grift, you know, con artist trying to get, yeah, that, that's, that's a tale as old as time. Of course, it's not, uh, surprising that we have, uh, cowardice amongst our, uh, legislators. That's also been there as well, well, but there's almost like no, all right, they're just, they're just cowards by default. It's not even issues in particular that scare them. You did the work to get into Congress and now, just as a default, you're a coward. It's not like something. It's, it's not like we have uh, to deal with a, a, a truly monumental issue that would make right. all of us like genuinely pucker right. a little bit. Okay, get it? No, you you just you you are your setting is dialed up to eleven. The pucker setting is eleven all the time. You know what, Aaron? What what? Chip is pointing out is we do get the government we deserve. Yes. They are a reflection of us. How many of us don't That's take hard. a stand? We don't want to be offended. Don't want to be alien. Don't want to alienate took, someone. Right. Yeah. Took the words right out of my mouth because I was going to reset this for for probably the 12th time in the last six months or so. Our elected representatives are not aberrations. They are reflections, both good and bad. Chip Roy is a positive reflection of his district. Hats off to Texas. I think it's 21. Hats off to you guys. He's a reflection of you. But if you are somewhere, what is it, Louisiana is where Mike Johnson is from? Correct. Are you more likely to find people whose stated beliefs line up with the beliefs of, of Mike Johnson and maybe even this show, but who are unwilling to go to the school board meeting because right. Lizzie down the street might look at you sideways? Are you more likely to find that type of person in Louisiana, in Mike Johnson's district, or in Texas, in Chip Roy's di- district? It's more likely, in my estimation, that you'd find that type of profile of a person in Mike Johnson's district. Correct. Because they are reflections of us. Yep. How in the world? I just saw a tweet the other day. I can't remember. I wish I could attribute it. I can't remember who said it. If they listen to the show on the off chance, you know who you are. But it was something along the lines of Christians should be the best statesmen. Christians. Believers in the one true God. Because they understand human nature to a T, at least we should. That should make us the best statesmen. But how in the world would you expect your elected representatives to go and hold the line in a place far, far away from home in the midst of all of the glitz and glamour, the glitz and glamour and and accoutrements of of Washington, D.C.? How would you expect them to hold the line there if you can't hold the line at fill-in-the-blank middle school? That doesn't make any sense. So, again, it starts with us. What are we willing to do? There's no good answer to that, Aaron McIntyre. Revival or bust. That's the answer. All right, let's get to it. For the first time in 2024, some Pop Culture Tuesday. And now that I have seen all the 2023 movies that were on my list uh, of interest to see, uh, time for me to unveil my top 10 films of the year and why they made it. And uh, we'll start with number 10, Sound of Freedom. And I, I teased you guys last week that I had the hardest time with what to do with this movie. It was, I got a chance to see the movie in late June, so before the uh, the, the mid-year, and I always give a, a top 10 list of movies six months into the year. It was number one on my list halfway through the year, which means it still should be somewhere around the top five or six. And and now it barely made the list. One, this ended up, there's not a lot of good movies this year, but, or last year, but a lot of the movies I saw were good, if that makes sense. Okay. There weren't as many movies that provoked me to go see, uh, go to theaters last year, but I mean, there were a lot of them, even Aquaman and, and the Lost Kingdom. I mean, that's a, a dead franchise that's being rebooted and we won't see again for two more years. That was even an enjoyable movie. Wonka is really good. Um, the Last Mission Impossible, not, not quite as good as the previous iteration, but still a very good movie. So there weren't a lot of movies worthy of going to see at theaters last year, but a lot of the ones that I did go to see, I thought were actually pretty good. So Sound of Freedom, I, I decided to go ahead and put them on the list, but make them at the bottom of the list. Here's why. In terms of quality, it is a better movie than this. But, and this is where I'm just going to give my own team, I think I should hold my own side more accountable. I I don't, based on what's happened since, I don't know how much of anything in that movie is actually true. And in terms of the specific events and how they're depicted, I don't. I do know human trafficking is true and a plague. 
I do know that. Uh, I do know pedophilia is, is true and a plague. I do know that. And I do know that Jim Caviezel is incredible as Tim Ballard in the film. I don't know who Tim Ballard is and if, what, what, what's real about him and what's not. But I do know a real good performance when I see it. It's still overall a, a great film with a, with a tremendously important story. Even if there's, there's more mythology and embellishment here than fact. So for that reason, I decided to go ahead and, and still include it in the top 10. Any thoughts? I haven't seen it yet. And the, the response uh, or lack thereof of the Ballard camp to what would be heinous allegations if they were a lie and clearly made up just to try to keep the darkness going on. But the, 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 the bad response or the lack of response kind of reminds me of the whole Roy Moore thing. Like what? You you got to come out against this stuff and destroy these allegations, and I, they just haven't been done. I mean, where is Tim Ballard? The, now the difference is Roy Moore did file a lawsuit, which he eventually won, by the way. Oh, I, yeah. ultimately yeah. yes, but you remember that was our big frustration. Mm-hmm. I, you got to come out and you, you made the movie. Now you got to fight the demon. There was no way around that fact. That one, even if this wasn't true, they were going to try to destroy that movie. We kind of saw that early on. Look what they tried to do with you. You know how this. And that's goes. why it's a two hundred million dollar movie yes. because they, if our, our movie never, you know, Nefarious never reached the critical mass that it got on their radar. And if it would have, then same thing would have happened with our movie. There would have been a bunch of rush to support it at a defiance of the media. Right? Yeah, they did reach that critical mass with Sound of Freedom, and that's how it ended up being a worldwide, uh, or at least a nationwide phenomenon. Aaron, have any thoughts? No? Okay, we'll move on. Number nine, Equalizer 3. Love this movie. Um, love its message. Faith is is, is central uh, to the, the message of this film. Uh, Denzel Washington's performance, it's Denzel, man. You know, so the performance is somewhere between good to spectacular every single time. Dude, it's just it's cash money, homie. And um, the overall story of... A guy who starts out in this franchise based on the TV series from when we were kids, just as basically a ruthless vigilante, and now is learning to channel it uh, into something um, that has, um, um, I-, I guess we'll call it a a morally equivalent response. That not everything has to immediately go to DefCon. Is it one is the worst or is it five? I can't even remember. Okay. Um, we don't have to go nuclear at every single point to learn that there's a higher purpose. Um, uh, I just, it's very, very well done. And uh, it's Denzel, brother. So it's number nine on my this list. This is finally streaming. So I can't wait to see it. To help me with, I've seen the first one, but I never saw the second one. Do you need second, to? No. Do you need to see it to have this one? No, this ties much more to the first than the second okay. one. And the second one's okay. This is a much better film. Much mm-hmm. better. All right. Number eight. Anything on that, Aaron? I haven't seen any of these movies. This might be the first time that I haven't seen a single <laughs> there it movie is. on this list. Now he's got an excuse, though. He's got a kid. Now it's not just he's a shut-in. Yeah. Don't knock on my door. I mean, that's who he is anyway. Yeah. Okay, but now you, you have an excuse. All right, number eight. This is a movie I was not going to see, and then I saw, frankly, your review, and I thought, okay. There's another guy who rarely goes to the movies, but my daughter, my, especially my youngest, my 13, absolutely loves uh, this trilogy. This is one of the first things we did as a family when mm-hmm. COVID hit. I had only seen the very first Hunger Games at that point. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I, This movie is stunning. And now, it, as a standalone, if you... You really, this is one you need to to fully appreciate what they accomplished here. You have to have seen the Hunger Games thing, all four of those movies, because this movie is like the holy grail of understanding its source material yep. and bringing more life to what already was very successful and full of life. It's just, it's perfect. Hunger Games, the Ballad of Songbirds and Snakes. It's the prequel to the 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 smash uh, you know book series and and movie series to watch the deconstruction of president snow to watch how that mm-hmm. goes down in real time viola davis as his mentor is insanely ruthless in the film as well um it's just a great movie man and it it has a lot to say yes. to our current contemporary when culture we, at the exact when same time we talk time. about the show yes. this is an education yes. about the show oh yes yeah uh, phenomenal film number 7 Air. 
uh, which uh, tells another movie uh, with Viola Davis. Another it, by movie the way. I've seen, and it's yeah. excellent. Yeah, this tells the behind-the-scenes story of the launching of the uh, Air Jordan line for Nike. So many phenomenal uh, performances in the film. Um, I mean, Matt Damon... It, it, it's hard. Now he's getting older, so he's not, you know, probably for you ladies, not quite the looker he was, but he certainly is still a movie star to turn him into, um, uh, you know, the, the, basically, a a slob. Okay. That's the, the guy who started, uh, the Nike air Jordan line, uh, was not an easy transformation, but it's extremely well done. And in terms of a period piece, it nails that era. It just absolutely nails it. So Air is number seven on my list. A film that is a very similar in its approach, but I think actually is executed even better is number six on my list. And that is Blackberry. This absolutely captures the essence of the 90s every bit as well as Air does of the, uh, of the mid-1980s. It tells the story, the rise and fall basically of the dot-com boom. Um, it's even better acted in my view. It's even better written in my view. I think it's, uh, it's, it's living history, watching it play out in real time. And then also seeing what greed at least, at least in the case of Air, you have a family, a strong family unit guiding some of the, the ambition surrounding a young Michael Jordan. Here in Blackberry, there's none of that. There, there's, there's no God. There's no, there's no fa- family unit. There is no plumb line at all. It is just Malthusian ethics. And, and you see both its ascension and then inevitable descension at the exact same time and very brutal uh, reality. So if you liked air, Blackberry is the, is the same kind of movie, same approach without the happy ending. Uh, number five, um, a very inspiring, stunning film that I think got overlooked, uh, because it came out right around the same time our movie did where Hollywood just decided to release all these movies in April, the covenant, uh, by Guy Ritchie, Guy Ritchie, uh, with Jake Gyllenhaal telling the story of a soldier who was freed by an Iraqi, uh, or by an Afghani during the invasion of Afghanistan and the war on terror and was able to go home. Then he finds out that that Afghani and his family never got out and he feels like a Wookiee life debt thing. He's got to go back, man, and rescue him honor. He's honor bound. The dude code calls for it. Uh, phenomenal film. Number five on the list. Number four. I keep saying these are all great films. That's why they're on the list. Boy, the Boys in the Boat. And this is the kind of movie that uh, Disney used to make and doesn't make anymore. Like when Walt was alive kind of a film. Uh, there's a little bit of light profanity. Other than that, uh, there's no nudity, no sexuality, no sensuality. It perfectly captures the spirit of the times. George Clooney at this, I mean, did a masterful job, has largely a no name cast, which helps to kind of absorb uh, all the more with these young rowers at the University of Washington. Many of them had never rowed before. They're just doing it because they're desperate that they were going to get paid to be on the rowing team at school would pay for their tuition. And lo and behold, they end up uh, in, you know, marching next to Jesse Owens and in the infamous 36 Berlin Olympics and winning the gold medal. It's a stunning story uh, and it's exhilarating. And this may sound like faint praise. It's the best rowing movie I've ever seen. <laughs> Number three, maybe the best acting performance I saw this year, Joaquin Phoenix as Napoleon Bonaparte in Napoleon, but Ridley Scott. Um, the history of this has been how much has been debated, how, how, how accurate or not it is, who knows, you know, uh, knowing a little bit about that history. I didn't have too many major issues with it. Um, but uh, take, you know, Ridley Scott's Gladiator, that kind of cinematography and apply it now uh, to the French Revolution and the, Fr- and, and the establishment of, uh, uh, of, 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 of Napoleon as emperor and a fantastic uh, performance by Joaquin Phoenix. It is an incredible character study to watch over the course of, of almost three hours. And it also tells you, the again, maybe even unintentionally, what ends up happening when godlessness fights godlessness. It never works out. And that's kind of the end story of this tale. Number two is Godzilla minus one. There's a million things I could say about this movie. You guys know I'm the ugly American. I can't handle the subtitles. Everything's in Japanese. I was mesmerized. I mean, it was, it's an incredible tale. You're growing. Yeah, it, you. it, it, it is. <laughs> it is. Uh, it, it tells the story of, of you're literally watching a culture go from the culture of death that it was under the Hirohito cult, that there was honor and death. 
finding the glorious death. Basically, they were the Klingons, is what the, the Imperial Japanese were. And now they're just devastated by the United States. And now they've got to reinvent themselves as a culture. And now they have to embrace, well, what if there's actually meaning in life? What if there's actually meaning in living life, you know, and getting married, having a family, doing the things that, you know, make life significant. And you watch this all play out under the backdrop of a film that has some incredible special effects, even though it was made for only about $17 million. And a lot of the special effects in this film are better than the CGI that we see in the $200 million Marvel movies these days. You will not regret it. Masterfully done. Godzilla minus one. Number two movie I saw this year. Why is it called minus one? I don't know the answer to that, oh, actually. Really? Yeah. They, they don't, it doesn't really tell us much about that in the film. I, okay. I, yeah, I didn't, and I'm not asked because I feel like I'd get my fanboy credentials revoked for not knowing, but I'm a little yeah, I don't know shocked why. at the moment, yeah. quite frankly. Yeah. Um, number one, and number one with a bullet is the latest Christopher Nolan masterpiece, Oppenheimer told from multiple different timetables and angles at the exact same time. You have, a, you have a Cillian Murphy, another actor, who it's just a matter of is he good or great in every single role. Um, it's a masterpiece. Despite the fact it has the most awkward and oddest placement of nudity I've ever seen in a film. I, there's no point to it. It didn't have to be there. Uh, it completely detracts from the film. Uh, the, the, the whole thing with Florence Pugh, if I didn't know any better, he just was you know, personally enamored with her in some way. Take that out of the film and the rest of it, however, is a magnum opus. And I think I read yesterday that he basically cleaned up at the Golden Globes for it. So those are my top 10 movies of the year. Quick thought on that list before we say goodbye. I haven't seen this one yet, but I'm very much looking forward to it. And it's a solid list. I yeah, think maybe was... the best in the last four years. There's several movies that I still want to see, despite the fact that I haven't seen them. Will you eventually see them? I don't know. Romans 828.